in this video we're off to York to the Elvington Air Museum. Join me. Roll titles. <laughs> YouTube, Brian James at Microphone Third Guy with you once again and today we've left the caravan, we've gone away from Thailand, we're going to the Yorkshire Air Museum at Please RAF Elvington. Exit on the left. Noisy sat nav, just ignore the woman in the sat nav, you know what they're like. Anyway, it's um, it's a former Royal Air Force Bomber Command Station and we're going to be going there, we've got some really interesting aircraft, so I'll take you across there, we'll see what it's like and we'll do a video from there. See you later. Well, welcome to the Yorkshire Air Museum here at Elvington Airfield, and behind me is an Aberanson. And what I love about museums like this is you can see aircraft in different ways to what you normally do on an airfield. The Anson behind is sort of semi-stripped. You can see the construction of the, the fuselage there, which was um, then covered in fabric and then dove to make it taut. And you can see how it's been put together, and you can also see into the construction of the wings themselves. Something you, you don't see in a normal airfield if you see an aircraft flying past. We're going to be looking at one of the smallest aircraft in, um, in the display in a second, the Flying Flea. Then we're going to go out and see the bigger ones a little bit later. Now behind me is an aircraft my father used to fly in quite a lot when he was out in Singapore um, in, when the Korean War was on. And this is a, a, an Auster, which was used as a, a small transport, it was used as a train, it was used for all sorts. They were used it for, uh, out there for dropping pamphlets, dropping yeah, propaganda leaflets out onto them. Um, so an interesting little aeroplane and um, a little bit of a link to buy history there. Now the problem with taking photographs inside somewhere like this is uh, lack of light. Um, I've got the camera set to um, auto ISO and um, I'm shooting with my Lumix um, 12 to 60 at 3.5 to 5.6 wide open but I'm still sitting, at, um, still sitting at an ISO about 2000. So what I might do is I might switch the lens over to my 1.7 Olympus, my wide angle lens, and see if that's any better for this sort of thing. The restoration area now, and in the background, you can see a Royal Aircraft Factory BE2 from the First World War. And you can see the, the general construction in that, very similar to what I said about the Anson before, but where the Anson was made of um, lightweight aluminium tubing, this one's made of good old fashioned wood struts. And again, though, the same sort of idea fabric attached over the top and then doped to give it some tension and um, rigidity to shrink the, the fabric down. Looking at the seats though, you can see that this was not what you call high tech in those days. You weren't meant to uh, necessarily take bullets through this with the, the, the wicker basket type seats. But of course they were light and that was an important thing on this. Now looking elsewhere in the restoration area, we can see down in the back, maybe you can just about make out a hurricane. I'll try and zoom in on this in a second. what I think is an Avro 504 and if you look just in the corner there you'll see the back end of a jet provost one of the RAF's um, first jet basic trainers I haven't even got through the first building yet I'm also already seeing some really interesting things behind me is a refueling dr um, drogue which is basically um, you can see at the back of it you've got the parachute which pulls out the, the um, the hose pipe and when we go outside and see the Victor this is what would have been underneath a Victor tanker's wings to dispense fuel for mid-air refueling. You've got the pod here, the drogue at the back which pulls the hose out and then is wound back in on this one. Swinging around behind me you've got a Canberra nose piece but also an Olympus engine from a Concorde and you can see the, the display there marked with British Airways on the side of it. So this was the engine which took Concorde Mach tw to twice the speed of sound. So coming out into the sunshine we see our first glimpse of the big aircraft. We've got on the left hand side a Nimrod, on the right hand side the Vulcan bomber V2 and behind it is a couple of interesting aircraft, a pair of uh, Mirages and uh, looks like Mirages anyway, I'll double check when I get across there, certainly at least one Mirage there but also it looks like a, a, a T-33. I'll find out for sure when I get across there but that's what they look like from this distance. Swinging round you get the fantastic wartime aircraft, the Dakota, the, C, the C-47 or the DC-3, depending on what guys it was in. Um, the C-47, of course, was the, the gunship version. DC-3 was a passenger airliner. And there were thousands of these aircraft made. Many are still in service throughout the world, but this one is uh, in military markings and uh, Royal Air Force markings. And these would have been used extensively during the Normandy campaign when uh, we were doing the pushback into France to then start taking back over Europe after the Second World War. 
thousands of people were parachuted out of those aircraft and uh, really major aircraft in that campaign. Very underrated at times but beautiful. With the Hawker Hunter behind in the fantastic and wonderful blue colour. Um, it's worth just taking a little look around here. If you haven't been to Elbington Airfield before, it really is a fantastic place to visit. I've shown you Carlisle, Air, uh, Carlisle Airport Museum before, and that's a great little museum, but this is just on a different scale. And it's one of the best of the sort of outdoor museums in the country, I think. There are some bigger ones. Duxford, for instance, is a fabulous place with some amazing aircraft, but this is quite a, a small, friendly place. And uh, it's got some really cracking aircraft. Just scanning around behind, we've got a hunter in the background there. Jet Provost coming into sight. I'm trying to see what's on the screen behind me because I'm not able to look back easily. What else do we have? Well, straight behind the, the Jet Provost is a Fairy Gannet, which is one of these at Carlisle as well. Um, so I've watched the restoration of that, but this one's um, nicely here. Scanning around from there, it looks like either a heron or a dove. I'll have to see if it's uh, um, if it's the four engine or the two engine one. I've got a feeling it could be a, a, a dove, the two engine one. And also lost a Meteor, which was um, Britain's first jet fighter. Came out in 1944, saw wartime service, the only Allied jet fighter to see wartime service. Um, never actually took on any of the German um, jet aircraft in, in direct combat, but it was used quite effectively to bring down V2 flying bombs, because it was fast enough to be able to keep up with them and tip the, tip the wings of flying bombs and knock them off course. Now looking sideways on we can see the hunt in this resplendent blue colouring that it's got here. Fantastic, unusual colouring for it. Swinging around as I say we have the Jet Provost here. Now this one's either a T3 or a T4. We can tell that because it's got the wingtip tanks on but also it doesn't have the pres fully pressurised cockpit. The T5 didn't have the tip tanks but it had a fully pressurised cockpit and a total different sort of front end design. Moving on to the massive Fairy Gannet. Yes, it's a, piston, it's a, uh, a propeller engine aircraft, but it does have um, two jet engines in there, two turboprops, fed through a gearbox and counter-rotating props, contra-rotating propellers, I should say, which is um, those spin in opposite directions. Now this one you can see with its wings folded, the tail hooks visible at the back, and also a massive radar pod underneath. This is the airborne, airborne early warning version of the aircraft. As I say, there's one of these at Carlisle, and uh, I've been watching its restoration as the time's gone on. Very, very interesting. But this one, a uh, couple of, couple of um, Rolls-Royce Mamba engines, if I'm not mistaken. I've got to try and double-check on this. If I'm not right, I'll let you know below. But an absolutely massive aircraft. When you see beside the little jet propus, jet trainer, you can see the sort of size difference. Moving on, we have the... Uh, the English Electric Lightning. This one you can see with the um, with the fuel tanks over the wings. The Lightning, Britain's first Mach 2 operational jet fighter, and still one of the fastest aircraft going. Um, fabulous aeroplane. Unfortunately, incredibly poor um, fuel performance. It didn't have a huge amount of fuel in there. Two Rolls-Royce Avon engines in the centre, one above the other, and slightly staggered, so as one was slightly in front of the other. And in this one, what they did is they tried to get it a little bit more um, more usable by putting tanks, fuel tanks above the wings. And this one was also, um, I think it was either Fire Streak or Red Top Rockets. You can see a rocket on the side uh, for air to air combat. And uh, absolutely fa fabulous one, uh, this aeroplane. It's such a shame we would only see them doing anymore. There, there was a couple of these flying in. Um, South Africa, but I believe that the place that we're flying from has closed down and been ground, which is just a, such a shame because they were a beautiful aeroplane in flight and um, nothing could really touch them. They could climb vertically, um, just sitting on the tail, and very, very quickly get up to Mach 2. And one of the few aircraft which could actually catch up something like Concorde and take photographs of it. There's some um, unique photographs of Concorde taken from Lightnings because nothing else could keep up with it. Now coming across here, I did say it was a Dove or a Heron. It was neither, this is a Devon. The Dove and the Devon were basically the same aircraft. Um, twin twin engined transport aircraft, light transport for the RAF and the Royal Navy. And the, the Air Force one was called the Devon. The, um, the Naval one was called the Dove. And you can see that um, wonderful sort of domed cockpit there. Really gave um, an unusual look to these aircraft. Um, Fabulous little trainer on the time. They had a, a long, um, illustrious service with the with the armed forces, with the British armed forces, and uh, a real pleasure to see it here at the at the museum today.
Well here we can see Gloucester Meteor which as I said was uh, Britain's first jet aircraft and uh, operational jet aircraft and the only one to see operational service in the Second World War from the Allied side. This is an F8 version which had um, considerably upgraded uh, engines and flying surfaces because it was such a, a new sort of concept, new design, there were problems with the Meteor. It was produced in large numbers, but they had problems if you had an engine failure where you got asymmetric, prop, asymmetric problems, especially if you're coming into land. They lost an awful lot of pilots, an awful lot of aircraft because of um, crashes due to that. So there was a big update on uh, both the engine power, which was very minimal in the first place, uh, in the early versions, and also insofar as the flying controls and the, the wing surfaces. Um, I'm more used to seeing uh, uh, an NF-14, which is a two-seat night fighter version, but this is the F-8, which was probably the, the greatest number produced of the Meteor design. Now that tractor is a site which would have been common to a lot of my RAF colleagues from um, from many years ago. Uh, the only difference is of course the day glow bibs which we didn't tend to wear in those days. Um, but it's really nice to see not only the aircraft but the, um, the realistic nature when you get period sort of pieces which are used around it. Something, something like the tractor to be able to pull the aircraft around really makes this more of a, a living museum than uh, just something static and practical really makes it interesting because it puts you more into, this, into the, the timeline that you would have seen with some of these aircraft when they were actually operational now on my way to the big boys now i'm going to have a look at the uh, the big ones the vulcan the mirage and uh, the nimrod and see what see if i was actually correct before on what the aircraft are now these are fabulous because these are these are of my era when i was in the in the regular air force I worked on air defence radars and we would have been controlling, or the controllers, which on the air radars that I used to look after, they would have been controlling Nimrods, they would have been controlling Vulcans, Victors, uh, Lightnings, um, all those sort of aircraft. So this is really of my era, the Cold War era, and um, I mean I'm 62 years old now. Um, when I joined in 1979, these were the, com were the current aircraft. In fact, I'm just looking at that Nimrod, which is 5-0. I've actually been on that Nimrod. Oh, I'm going to definitely go and have a look at that one. Well, let's see how much of a smart aleck I was when I was looking around before. As I say, there's the, the Nimrod 5-0. I'm going to have a look at that in a few moments because I'm, that is an aircraft which I've actually been on for real when it was still operational. 5-0 was up at Kinloss for, some, for quite some, some time. And um, it's fabulous aeroplane, incredible aeroplane. It was based on the Comet, which was the um, the very first commercial jet airliner. You can see on the top of that as well, just zoom you in slightly, excuse the fingers, but just zoom you in. You can see on that one the refueling probe on the top and the, the MAD, the magnetic anomaly detector, which is on the top of the tail, just you know, that sort of blob on the top of the tail there. Basically looked out for, for ships. It was a, a maritime aircraft, incredibly manoeuvrable. There's a, there used to be a photograph in the officer's mess at uh, RAF Kinalos with one of those literally perpendicular to the ground, 90 degrees to the ground, and in perfect flight. They were incredible aircraft, very, very strong, and used to operate at incredibly low level of the sea. Um, I don't know what officially were, but I know that an awful lot of them got very wet as they were flying, so it says an awful lot about how close they got to the sea. The, um, the Hawker Siddeley, later British Aerospace Nimrod. We'll have a look at that in a second. Now coming on to this Royal Canadian Air Force Silver Star, this was um, the two-seat version of the, the shooting star, star, which was the, um, the P-80. This was um, a T, well it's the one, T-133, it's based on the T-33. Wonderful aircraft, very, very numerous in the American Air Force and uh, other air forces around the world. I'm not sure that the Royal Air Force had them. I, I think they may have, but I'm not totally sure. I'd have to look up on that, but certainly the Royal Canadian Air Force had one. And here's one here. This one's uh, Lockheed Canada Silver Star, a CT-133. And um, two-seat, it was meant as a trainer, but it was also used by a few air forces as an operational aircraft. Now I said before about the reality of um, having the period sort of tractors pulling the period, period aircraft. Here's the Gloucester Meteor, the F-8 that we looked at before. 
being pulled along by the tractor. As I say, the only thing really difference is the amount of crowds and civilian clothing. It would have been all RAF clothing in those days. And of course the day glow jackets. But uh, let's just take a couple of seconds to watch this wonderful aircraft being maneuvered around the place. Now I'm just moving back a little bit because although it's a small jet fighter aircraft, it's still big enough to cause me a little bit of damage if I get in the way of it and hurt it. Yeah, so I'm, I'm clearing out the way and making it, their job easier. Oh, I've been told I'm probably good about right here, which is great. Now the fascinating thing when you see people in these museums, yeah, they, they, they do this, it's a, it's a hard job to do, it's, it's hard work, but they do it from love. When you see aircraft like this, there is a real love affair from, from the people who look after them to make sure that they're kept. Because this is heritage we're going to lose if we don't look after them. And uh, they had such a significant part on an awful lot of people's lives over the last century that um, we need to keep an eye on them, make, they keep on maintaining them, make, need to keep them so that the next generations can enjoy them in the way that we do. Now I spent 45 years of my life proudly wearing an RAF uniform. The amount of times I was at a flagpole like that, either saluting the ensign as it went up or down, or more often than not when I was um, duty NCO, having to raise or lower it. It, um, it does bring back some really happy memories for me. And good to see on a site like this that um, you've got those little reminders. Now we're heading back towards these aircraft. Now these aircraft are live aircraft. They're actually um, taxable. They do taxi demonstrations of these aircraft here so as you can see on the signs they are live aircraft they're fueled up but uh, we get this magnificent um, Victor ta Victor aircraft it was a Victor bomber but a Victor tanker in the end because they did conversions and if you are, are ever for, here for one of the open days they're magnificent to see they really are because um, the power and the noise of something like this is incredible now this is a sort of sister aircraft to the Vulcan that we've seen at Carlisle, it's in, in fact in the title videos, the, there were three V bombers um, which were developed in the, the late 40s and early 50s which were meant to be um, the, the nuclear deterrent for Britain. There was the Valiant which was the first one which um, was basically um, quite an old-fashioned design uh, insofar as it was a, a good stopgap. If they weren't sure this was developmental times, everything was new. We'd come away from the Second World War where we had things like Lancaster. And the last aircraft we had from Avro, for instance, after the Lancaster was the Vulcan, the great Delta Wing Vulcan. Now this is a Handley Page um, Victor and this one effectively was the next one from the Halifax. So you can see there was a huge step forward. A couple of hundred mile an hour, maybe 300 mile an hour um, difference in speed. Certainly a much higher service ceiling. You're getting into 40,000, 45,000 feet with these, which we had nowhere near that on the, the Second World War bombers. And a huge bomber load. I think this is about 35,000 pounds of bomber load. Uh, the Vulcan was about 20,000. But the first one was the Valiant, the Vickers Valiant, which was to a much older design and a much more um, uh, older sort of construction. Um, they lasted quite well, uh, unfortunately, because of the change in how they did the, um, the, the bombing strategy. The Valiant wasn't so good at low level and they got um, problems, cracks in the main spars and the whole fleet was grounded in the, in the early to mid 60s. Which left the Vulcan and this one, the Victor. Um, this one, the Vulcan of course had the Delta wing, this one's got a crescent shaped wing. And a fabulous aeroplane, really was a fabulous aeroplane. Um, and for many, many years was the main nuclear deterrent. These became tankers, as I say, and if we look at something like the Falklands War in 1982, there was about 16 aircraft which were 
um, involved in getting one Vulcan to do a bombing run on Stanley Airfield. And the majority of the tanking of the aircraft was done by victors. So although the Vulcan got the glory of being the one that dropped the, the munitions, it wouldn't have got there without the victor. Fabulous aeroplane. And this one, as I say, still taxis. Moving along. I said I thought we had a couple of Mirages and we do this is a Mirage 3 um, quite a small aeroplane um, French built Dassault Mirage 3 jet fighter um, Delta wing and uh, these were used well, I just mentioned the Falklands War these were used by the Argentinians in that conflict and very very effectively never underestimate uh, even though uh, Britain was credited with winning that particular conflict. Never underestimate the munitions that the uh, Argentinians had. They had some fantastic uh, equipment and the Mirage 3 was certainly one of those. Looking to the left we have the Mirage 4. Much much bigger, much faster and uh, a totally different design concept of aircraft and uh, very very high up there um, on the thing. I think these were actually designed for naval use. I Again I stand corrected but looking at the, um, the extension of the front legs, I wouldn't be surprised if it was for naval use. Again, if I'm wrong, please bear with me, but drop comments below because I'd love to hear your comments and I'd love to read them about these. If you have an interest in aviation especially, please leave me something because um, I find this sort of thing very fascinating. Now the big difference with the Mirage 4 was that this was meant to be France's nuclear deterrent delivery method and um, very effective it would have been too. It was. Um, it was operated in a similar sort of way to the, the QRA, the quick reaction alert that the British were doing, uh, but a very different concept to the likes of the, the Vulcan and the Victor insofar as how they did their nuclear deterrent discharge. Um, but again, very, very capable aircraft for its time. The French, of course, changed their, their nuclear policy. They were, always in, they were always up there with the nuclear weapons capability, but they, the French came out of NATO for a good number of years and went their own way. And you can see this in the way that the aircraft developed in comparison to the Americans with the B-52 and us with the RV bombers. Now I'm here beside uh, 5-0, an old friend, meeting an old friend that I've been on this aircraft for real. Um, didn't fly in it, um, but I have been, I've been taxied up and down the airfield. This one was at um, RAF Kinloss for a good time when it was operational when I visited up there. And uh, XV-250, which is where they get the 5 from, was an aircraft up there which I've actually physically been on. So it really is saying hello to an old friend. Now this particular one is being kept in fully operational condition. It can't fly, um, it's not authorised to fly, but all the systems, all the engines are in fully operational condition as is the um, the previous couple of aircraft that we've seen. And this again does taxi tr taxi demonstrations up and down the airfield here at, Over at Elvington on open days. Now if you haven't been to Elvington, it really is, as I say, well worth coming to. But also, if you have a look on the Elvington website, you can see you can support the museum because these are, these are privately funded museums and expensive to run. Um, just to do a taxi trial on one of these uh, aircraft takes a huge amount of fuel. You've got four great big Rolls-Royce Avon engines in this one, four great big Conways, I think it is, in the um, in the uh, the Victor. So just keeping these things to be able to taxi up and down the airfield takes thousands of pounds, and that's on top of just the regular maintenance. Because even though they just taxi, they're still going to have a full maintenance program on those engines. If you don't, they are dangerous things. Now what a great deal of people don't, don't realise about the Nimrod, it was one of the uh, few aircraft along with the V bombers which was actually uh, equipped with nuclear weapons, in this case nuclear depth charges which could, be, um, which could be discharged. The pilot could discharge them but it couldn't be done without the authority from the crew in the background so it was a, very much a team effort and it had to be authorised from much higher up but it was a nuclear capable aircraft all the same during our Cold War period. Now also you'll see there's a massive, massive equipment bay underneath where depth chargers, uh, sonar boys and all sorts of things were from. In fact they used to drop um, sonar so down from the rear of the fuselage down through a hole into the sea. But this one also had torpedoes and a huge weapon load. So although it looks a little bit like a, uh, an overinflated airliner, it was an incredibly, incredibly efficient and potent aircraft in its day. Now as I said a little bit earlier in the video, the, uh, the authenticity of having the, the, the older stuff here really does put you back 
into a different era. And just seeing the corrugated Nissan huts in the background really does make you make you feel as if you're in a, 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 a mid-war, even um, early 50s airfield. And that really is uh, a step back in time. Now, a few years ago, in 2018, I had the pleasure of taking about 25 air cadets over to Normandy and um, going around all the the battlefields of Normandy after the, the D-Day landings and also the beaches and there'll be a lot of my American viewers who are on here. It, it was a moving experience going to um, the beaches where the, the Allied forces um, landed. When you go to places like Omaha in Utah Beach, um, which um, the Americans had some incredible losses on, um, it was a very poignant um, experience to go around them. But part of that D-Day landing, a big part of that D-Day landing, was due to this aircraft. This is the, um, the Douglas Dakota, the DC-3, or if it was a gunship version, the C-47. And there were thousands of these aircraft produced. Many are still in service, as I said earlier today, as airliners still. Some have been operated the turboprop aircraft, uh, turboprop engines. But this is um, in the RAF colours from wartime. And many, many paratroopers were dropped uh, during the day they landed from aircraft such as this. Um, in some incredible um, battles which ensued afterwards. And what really was the turning point of the Second World War. So very, very significant aircraft in so far as our history, whether you're British, or allied. Now, I'm about to go inside the hangar here and this is one of the things I've really been looking forward to in this excursion to um, to to Elvington because this is the last surviving Halifax bomber um, and I you know the, the Lancaster gets an awful lot of the the praise it was a phenomenal aircraft but the Halifax um, was just as effective in many ways um, but there was so few of them left at the end of the war I don't think I think this is the last surviving one and I believe that this was this had to be rebuilt so let's swing around let's have a look at the back of this magnificent bomber and we'll take a walk, a walk inside the hangar and see it properly now for both photo and video uh, wise it, it gives us some of those problems again so back to an open aperture and uh, high ISOs so of course you get the problems with noise and things and uh, uneven lighting but at the same time just to see something like this really is worth it now if you enjoyed this video don't forget to give a big thumbs up below if you would and if you're not a subscriber why not it's free just hit the subscribe button below and really down there hit the notifications and the little bell and tick the all because that will get you notifications every time I upload a video onto this channel Well, here we have the Messerschmitt ME BF 109, which was um, the principal German fighter against the Spitfire and Hurricane, in, at least in the early part of the war, until the Focke-Wulf 190 came along. Again, a very, very potent aircraft, but totally different in its design concept to what the Spitfire and Hurricane were. Um, but went through many different changes and different uh, models and kept itself, as did the Spitfire, very much up to date as to, um, to be a, a worthy competitor in the, in the battle. One advantage it had over the Spitfire was this wider undercarriage. The Spitfire had a very narrow undercarriage and could be a bit difficult in landing. The ME109 was considered to be an awful lot easier to land and easier to control. And as we scan up alongside this Halifax, it's massive in this hangar. It really is beautiful and we can walk clearly underneath the wings without getting anywhere near it. But it does dwarf the other aircraft around it including the ME109G. Now unlike the Lancaster which was noted for having its Merlin engines, its uh, V-shaped configuration, this one had Bristol Siddeley Hercules engines which were a radial engine, so a very different concept of engine, but just as effective with incredibly well used engine during the Second World War, incredibly powerful too. Now I did mention about the Dakota outside and the Normandy landings. Well this was a, an American glider which was used to um, to drop troops and um, armaments into um, the into the air, into the, the war zone. And you can see here there's a howitzer inside, a 75 millimeter howitzer inside the glider and the whole front of the glider lifts up so you can see the seam between the cockpit 
and the, the rear part. As the glider landed, the skids on the bottom and the wheels, but as the glider landed, that front piece would come up and it would roll out the front. Many, many uh, of these uh, gliders were built, of various different types of glider built for the landings and with different uses. And a lot of them were carried across by things like the Halifax that we've just seen. They were used as the target, as the, the two aircraft, and then dropped near the battle zone for these to come in and be a very, very effective at putting ground troops out quickly along with their equipment. Which has got a couple of my favourite aircraft. And it's going to sound odd that these are my, most my favourite aircraft because it's, well, it started out as a Royal Naval aircraft. And uh, I, hate, I hate to say, no, no offence to my naval, my naval viewers because they love you all, but this started off as a naval aircraft, and again it was nuclear capable, but um, this was an aircraft which um, I had again some association with um, when I was an air cadet. We'll tell you about it in a couple of seconds, but if I swing around, there's one of them, you can see this, this is a Blackburn Buccaneer. Um, Coke bottle shaped, it was um, very, very efficient airplane design, super, super at low level, and uh, just a proper shape of them. This is a Royal Naval version. It's maybe, I think it's an S2 the size of the, of the inlet, but there was the S1 which has smaller engines, the S2 which had spare engines built into it. But um, in the 70s, we were supposed to be, RF had meant to be getting the F111, of course, we never did get the F111 from the US, very pretty at that time. So we took on some F4 Phantoms, but also the Buccaneer into RAF service. And I remember as a cadet, a young cadet in the, uh, the, the, the mid-70s, going across the Wittersloe and Larbrook. And at Larbrook seeing 15 and 16 squadron with these and going and sitting in the cockpit with the, the Buccaneer. Fabulous. Of course, later on, when we had the first Gulf War conflict, these aircraft were painted up in Gulf colours and were very, very effective in the desert campaign at low-level um, attacks. Um, during that and very very effective aircraft in the time. Did a huge amount of service in the British forces and um, I think also South African forces had the Buccaneers extremely successfully too. So um, this is the, as I say, the Blackburn Buccaneer. Wonderful aircraft, developed for carriers in the first place but ended up being very much a, a mainstay of the Air Force uh, with various squadrons. You'll also seen as I was scanning around the Buccaneers there, just tucked in the background, the GR3 Harrier. Uh, the vertical takeoff and landing uh, aircraft, which was developed by um, by Hawker originally, and then Hawker Sidley, and then British Aerospace after that. And then, um, for my American viewers, this was the AV8, which you took on uh, from us. But also, you developed um, wings to take this beyond the GR3 when you got onto the GR7, GR9 sort of variant. They used a very different wing shape. Now, this had a, um, a Bristol Sidley Pegasus engine. In there, which was an incredible vector thrust engine, single engine in there, and the thrust on the side, I can show you in a second. The inlet's there, the thrust on the side, as I say, came out through two nozzles on either side, which would pivot round and vector the thrust down, so it sat on a cushion of its own jet blast. You also had, if you look down the wings, in the tips of the wings they had um, variable jet thrust, which would come out and give it stability either wing and also underneath the, the nose and the tail. Very, very effective um, aircraft on it, in its time. Um, there was also a naval version and of course these and the naval version were used extensively down in the Fulton's campaign in, the, in 1982. It's a great effect. Now, if this comes into focus, I've just been talking to, a, uh, to one of the curators here, a chap called Nigel, and he sent me something of a problem. This is a nose cone from a buccaneer. We've just been looking at the three buccaneers there, the, um, the naval one, the RAF one in green and grey, and in the desert colours. And this is a nose cone. I'm going to go and show it on the aircraft, and then I have a question for you. Now here's our old naval version of it, as you can see, here's the nose cone, and there's a hole through it. And that hole goes from top to bottom, straight up through, I don't know if you can see it properly on there, goes straight through. Let's pull around to the, the Desert Coloured RAF one and there's that hole again. Now we don't know what that hole is for. 
So if you know what the little hole on the front, which goes vertically, straight through from top to bottom on the Buccaneer, on all variants, please let us know. Now one thing I didn't mention on the Buccaneers are these fabulous clamshell door air brakes at the back. This one and the one on the, matching on the other side give a terrific braking force as we land on carriers and airfields alike. And uh, again, just a unique sort of thing on the uh, Buccaneer which made it such an interesting aircraft. Now standing underneath it you can see the size of it. For a, a jet fighter it is absolutely massive and built like a tank. It's a really impressive aeroplane this one. You know these air museums are interesting places because we're fascinated by the aircraft but it's not just the aircraft which are part of the, the story. I said it before about the tractor but I mean wonderful things like this um, this Comma Commando bus which is here beautifully restored and uh, again just brings back that sort of memory of a, a, a bygone time. Now I said about the, the Buccaneers a few moments ago, I've got the Buccaneers now behind me on there but I'm going to swing around because I said about the coke bottle shape of the, the fuselage and if I pull around and let you see the RAF one here you can see the sort of wide hips at the back which gives a particular sort of distinct look to the aircraft. Now these aircraft were specialities at sort of low level attack very low level attack and what they used to do is used to do a real low level attack and then pull hard up and sort of throw bombs at the bottom um, towards the target so they were well clear and the bomb bay I don't know if you can see it on here Let's see if we can actually zoom in a little bit under there but the bomb bay on this is a fully rotating bomb bay so all the weapons were held inside and it's it rotated around longitudinally to release the bomb so a very very um, efficient aerodynamic shape um, and very very efficient weapons carrying until it was a case of needing to deploy them. Now this little thing down here is a rapier anti-aircraft missile and the trade I was in, I was an electronics technician air defence and we looked after mainly long range search radars but one of the other disciplines that we specialised in were um, air defence um, anti-aircraft systems with the rapier for the short range and and uh, Bloodhound for the big stuff. Now, I never actually worked on these, although I did work on missile systems, but this was very instrumental um, as a, a very effective weapon system for anti-aircraft for low level and short range, uh, used in the Falklands and also in Gulf War I, very, very effectively by the RAF Regiment. But my trade were the, the ones who looked after the radar, which was associated with this. And if we have a look on the little list here, you can see a launcher there with the radar dish tucked on the front. Very mobile system, very effective. Now we looked before at the Meteor F8, which was, uh, the Meteor was Britain's first operational jet fighter. This was the second, this was the de Havilland Vampire. And a very, very different design, a Goblin engine in its inside. This one's a two-seat trainer variant, but uh, the original one came with a Goblin uh, turbojet aircraft, uh, turbojet engine. And um, again, like the Mosquito, which had been built during the Second World War, a lot of this was wooden construction, was a, um, a composite wooden construction. So very light aircraft, very effective. But again, early days um, in jet aircraft technology. And with the distinct twin boom, which was also used on the later Venom and also the Sea Vixen from de Havilland. Now I've just mentioned the Goblin turbojet, not turbofan, turbojet engine, um, out of the, the Vampire, which you can see in the background. This is the engine, very, very short, um, because it's turbojet, um, it uses centrifugal um, compression, and it was a very, very short but wide engine. Um, very quickly um, superseded by the turbofan engines and the... Um, and the axial flow engines such as the uh, Spays and the Avons but in the day a very effective engine. Remember this was at the very early part, very earliest part of jet engine technologies and this was being developed during the Second World War. Now I mentioned the NF-14 a little bit earlier which is at Carlisle, the NF-11 and NF-14. This one's an NF-14 which is in the middle of restoration, it's being repainted as you can see at this moment in time, cockpit canopies are all off. Um, but you can see the amount of effort and dedication and care which this museum's putting into restoring the aircraft 
it's absolutely unbelievable what's being done here and uh, if you can support the museum please do so you can get on their website you can give donations um, because it is privately funded and the costs in here are astronomical to try and do these but without them our heritage disappears very very quickly and it won't be around for our um, for our children to see so if you can give some sort of support to this museum or in fact any of the, the good air, air museums around the, the UK or indeed around the world please do because these are part of our heritage and, dis heritage and disappearing quickly. Well while we're outside again in the sunshine and beside the Tonkas the pair of tornadoes affectionately known as Tonkas here a GR1 behind me and a GR4, you can hear the tractor in the background. Uh, that's going to be towing out the GR4 in a few moments uh, further around. We'll see it as we go around the back of the uh, museum here. But these were Mach 2 capable aircraft, um, again, part of our nuclear defense force until very, very recently when they've been superseded by the F 35 um, and, of, of, of course, the uh, Typhoon. That's the GR4 made his way around the front. As I said, they were a part of Britain's nuclear deterrent very, very recently until they were superseded by the F-35 and the, um, the Typhoon, which have been out. So, the Tornado, a very, very effective aircraft, started off as the MRCA, multi-role combat aircraft, and it was a joint partnership with Germany and Italy, and uh, extremely, effic extremely effective aircraft in its time. Now if you look into the, end, the, the back there, you can see this one doesn't have engines in. However, when we swing around to the GR1 here, it's a different case. This one is a live aircraft again, taxable, technically flyable probably, but um, obviously not to happen. Unfortunately, the beautifully long runway here at Elvington um, isn't capable of having um, runs. I thought, we'd, I thought they did, still did taxi runs for the uh, high-speed taxi runs for some of the aircraft like the Nimrod and the Victor, which I said at the beginning, but I've been informed, unfortunately, because of the state of the, the runway, that's not a possibility anymore, because the uh, the tarmac would probably be ripped up by the jet force from these aircraft, which is such a shame, because um, they are really something to behold. This, this noise, the vibration when they're trundling down the runway is fabulous. Now, I looked at the Meteor and the little vampire, but um, Britain's all-weather fighter fleet in the 1950s and 60s was supplemented by this. This is a Gloucester Javelin, a Delta Wing fighter um, and ground defence aircraft, which didn't really have the potential that it that it seemed to have with its looks. I think these are a beautiful aircraft. I've always loved the looks of the uh, the Javelin, a twin jet aircraft, um, low low supersonic speed, but. Um, it was, I don't know if I actually could go supersonic, it was certainly transonic, but very high transonic, low supersonic sort of performance. But a very effective all-weather aircraft and night fighter. And um, they used to have these based at RAF Leeming, which is just up the road from where I am, uh, which is still an operational airfield today. Um, but um, they had one of these for a long time, which was a gate guard then. I think it's gone down to somewhere in the southwest into a museum. So this is my, my chance to see a javelin uh, for the first time in a few years. And I still love the design of this aircraft. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video. There's also a slightly longer version of this on Patreon as well, um, which will be unique to them. So if you want to see the long version, consider becoming a Patreon member. Uh, there's three different tiers. If you're on t uh, tier two or three, then you get to see the unique footage. Um, but it all gives real support the channel and there's a list of names going up and down here of people who support the channel already thank you to them but if you want to see the full length video consider becoming a patron and you'll manage to see it but I'm going to wrap this video up now a few more shots as I go outside and uh, hopefully I think there's a camera just outside as well and maybe another look at a unique looking um, pre um, restoration hunter and maybe another look at that uh, GR4 tornado
you've enjoyed a little visit to Yorkshire Air Museum here at the Elbington Airfield today. There is one big, big problem with this museum. There's just too much of it to see in one day and one look at that. But if you buy a ticket, you can come back any time in the year and get in for free again. It's £14 for the normal admittance per adult. And as I say, you can come back whenever you like during that year and see all these things. So it's well worth seeing around, as we have very aptly timed an aircraft flying in the background. But come back and see the museum several times. It is well worth it. And if you have got an excuse to come up to Yorkshire, make it part of your excursion. Mm-hmm.